Hi everyone, I'm Lisa from the Siegel Center in Montreal and as a steering committee member, it's my honor to be uh, given uh, the opportunity to introduce our next speaker. So, let me just pull it up. Um, so we continue this narrative now uh, with creating a new narrative part two and we are articulating the impact of the arts. How do we as advocates of arts and culture take charge of the narrative about its relevance and impact? So we welcome Jeffrey Crossick, a distinguished professor of humanities in the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. His 2016 report on understanding the value of culture and the arts will speak to just that. So welcome Jeffrey. Thanks Lisa and thanks to you all, um, first of all for the invitation to speak here um, and secondly for returning after your well-being um, exercises. Um, I can't think you look any different than you did when you went but, but I hope you feel better. Um, well I've been, um, I've been asked a good question. How do we as advocates of arts and culture take charge of the narrative about its relevance and its impact? And my simple opening response is that if we want our advocacy to be effective, we should build a case that is not constructed with the sole purpose of advocacy in mind. We might then find that what we learn is more useful to us, which will actually make the advocacy more persuasive. I'll explain more about that as my talk goes on. In the talk, I'll be drawing on a, the big project that Lisa just referred to um, that I directed for the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council. The project was set up to identify the value of arts and culture to individuals and to society and to consider how we obtain evidence about that value. It funded 70 small pieces of research and drew on our reading of a much wider research literature. The aim of the work was to help reshape the debate about the value of culture, uh, to allow for more grown-up conversations, thanks Jill, um, where we didn't always insist on the benefit of the arts and where we only made claims for which we could provide evidence, but with evidence drawn from a much broader range of methods. Its report by um, Patricia Kaczynska and myself was published in 2016. Its core focus is the UK, but I've been asked to speak about it in many countries since it was published all over the world. And the questions and some of the answers seem to resonate everywhere. Um, you'll decide how well they do so in Canada. I've learned a great deal at this summit about the ambitions and the challenges of arts institutions concerned with cultural engagement in Canada. My report primarily derived from the UK situation, but I think the broader issues that I'm going to raise seem to me similar in their breadth, even if they might be different in their detail. Now, much of the summit has been about audiences, what people value in their cultural engagement. These are essential questions for organisations wanting to attract, to engage, and to satisfy audiences and to broaden them. And we just heard from Jill how TRG Arts has developed an imaginative approach to the use of data to understand patrons and audiences, and with it to build an improved offer and improve business. What audiences value is also, of course, a significant component of the wider value of cultural engagement, which is also what makes the culture track work that we heard about yesterday potentially relevant for much more than just audience building strategies. But what audiences value cannot in itself constitute the breadth of what is meant by the value of culture to individuals and society. I've been asked to step back from that issue of audiences that's been the focus of the summit and to address that broader picture through the specific lens of how we build a better narrative. The two themes converge the themes of the summit and the themes of my, uh, of my talk converge in the focus on individual experience, which we argue in the report is a fundamental but often neglected underpinning of the value of arts and culture. What happens when we visit a museum, watch a play, read a novel, join a community arts event, make a quilt, play a video game? We argue that personal experience as an individual or in a group drives much cultural value, and its neglect has weakened understanding of the difference that culture makes. Personal experience matters because cultural value does not reside in an artifact, a performance, or an event. Cultural value resides in how an artifact, performance, 
or event is engaged with by people, by audiences, by communities. Cultural value is to be found in processes, not in objects. Now, a key conclusion of the Cultural Value Project is that it's wrong to see the value of culture as an objective challenge, where we just have to work hard to find the right methods and the right narrative. Instead, we must ask four fundamental questions about any discussion of the value of culture and the narrative we build about why it matters. In the short time I've got, I'll structure my remarks around those four questions. First, who wants to know and why? Second, what's the phenomenon whose value we're trying to understand? Third, are we looking in the right places in our search for value? And fourth, by what methods should we find and evidence that value? And this last question matters because there is not data out there waiting to be mastered. What there is is a series of questions to be tackled before we start hunting for the evidence that we need to answer them. That is what research is about. And in answering these questions, we put ourselves in a much better position to speak to others. And we'll also have found a story to tell in which we have far more confidence, a narrative that we own rather than one that jump, that's the result of our jumping through hoops that government and other funders are holding up or which we think they're holding up. So first, who wants to know and why? Context is essential. In many countries, value is identified to secure government funding for the arts, and in terms that the sector thinks the governments want to hear. Though I was struck and impressed by the fact that the Canada Council this morning never once mentioned the economy amongst the deliverables in their discussion. That will be unthinkable in Britain and unthinkable in the United States, and maybe in the past it might have been unthinkable uh, in Canada as well. In Britain, the new Labour government from 1997 added other objectives, not just the impact of culture on the economy, but also the benefits for urban regeneration, social inclusion, health, and so on. It provoked the wonderful response by Britain's best-known ceramicist, Grayson Perry. This pot will reduce crime by 29%. <laughs> it's an example of what art can do <laughs> in one image and which takes us a lecture to, uh, to, to critique. The instrumental case for the arts was mostly about objectives that could be achieved by other means, and the case rarely compared outcomes with those other ways of meeting them. An alternative approach, one that begins with what arts and culture can irreducibly do, was rarely taken. But there are three reasons, not just one, for wanting to know about the value of arts and culture. There is research carried out by um, the research carried out by academics and others better to understand the phenomenon. There's evaluation carried out by cultural organisations as part of their accountability to funders. And there's reflective practice, with arts practitioners looking critically at what they've been doing in order to improve their practice and achieve their objectives. Until arts practitioners and arts institutions believe evaluation matters to them and not just to their funders, we won't see good quality evaluation. And so to my second question, what is the phenomenon whose value we're trying to understand? The UK debate on the value of culture is about government-funded provision. Museums and galleries, theatres and orchestras, dance and opera companies, and hundreds of mostly smaller organisations funded by the UK's arts councils. The culture that is evaluated is therefore narrow, as is the debate about who has access to it. The result is a neglect of where people get most of their cultural experience, which is through commercially provided culture, third sector organisations and amateur practice. Enlarging the focus to those makes us look in different places for sites of value. Almost all film, literature, music and games is provided commercially. Amateur engagement vastly exceeds professional as people make te textiles in their leisure time, join music groups, or make digital content online. Enlarging our focus also highlights the diverse places people engage with culture. Yes, museums, concert halls, theatres, but also small-scale spaces such as live music venues, institutions such as care homes and prisons, as well as while travelling and at home. The home indeed from frames most cultural engagement. In Britain, 94% of film is watched at home yet we still talk about going to the cinema. And it's where most music, television, craft, literature, 
video games, as well as digital online cultural activities, are experienced in the home. And virtually all of it is commercial or amateur. And by the way, I'm not clear how much of that, if any, is captured by Culture Track. They certainly didn't engage with cultural experience at home in their questions. Whether we want to know is, of course, dependent on why we want to know. Now, we're learning more about people's digital behavior in the cultural space. And we've heard about some excellent digital initiatives at this summit. But its impact on cultural experience is less understood. Not just access to commercial culture through streaming, but co-creation of content as digital platforms and online communities start transforming how culture is produced, performed, and experienced. My sense of how larger Canadian organizations arts organizations engage with the digital seems pretty similar to what I have seen in the UK, where analog organizations are struggling to adapt to a digital world. Their strategies are mostly shaped by the linear broadcasting model, new ways to reach audiences, and enhance experience of a conventional offer. But too rarely they allow the freedom for people to use content, content of the arts organizations, in ways outside the institution's control. The UK Department for Culture, Media and Sport has just published a report titled Culture is Digital. Actually, it isn't digital, but never mind. Culture is Digital, which is more interested in infrastructure, linear dissemination and audience data than in the huge potential for creativity and experiences in the digital space. So the discussion of the value of arts and culture has been too compartmentalized because we've started with an institutional-based conception of culture. Many of the benefits of cultural engagement have been shown to come from everyday culture, commercial provision, amateur practice. And unless we explore the value of all cultural engagement, we cannot begin to understand the difference that arts and culture makes. And only then can we ask the secondary, albeit very important question, about why some of it should be funded by the state or by foundations. And we have to recognize the ecosystem the ecosystem, where boundaries between publicly funded, commercial, third sector and amateur are incredibly permeable. The flows between publicly funded and commercial are the most obvious, with subsidised arts taking risks and spending time developing talent and ideas which later frequently benefit the commercial sector. But there are many other flows of money, talent and ideas within this ecosystem. For example, research for the Cultural Value Project found a myriad of interactions between those involved in live music production in a range of cities in the UK, a dense web of interactions in which distinctions between commercial, subsidised and amateur simply seemed irrelevant. Enlarging the range of cultural experience makes us question the deficit model, which is how cultural participation is discussed, certainly in the UK and in the US. The deficit model asks who is missing from publicly subsidised provision but without asking about the cultural activities that those people, often from disadvantaged or marginalized social groups, are engaging with rather than where they're missing. The Cultural Value Project and the US National Endowment for the Arts organized together a symposium in Washington, D.C. that challenged the assumptions behind participation service, surveys, thought about alternative ways of gathering data, and the discourse around access, and, and, and a great deal more. Uh, there's a full published report if you're interested in it. In Britain, a broader focus than that offered by the deficit model captures streamed film, music on YouTube, television, crafting at home, sharing photos on Flickr, singing in a church choir, and a great deal more. And it offers a way into the cultural practices in, within minority ethnic communities that are mostly overlooked by policy debates on participation, something I've become very struck by as chair of the Crafts Council in England, where contemporary craft means a heavily white world, even though we know that there are rich traditions of practice, especially in British South Asian communities. Inequalities of access, resources and infrastructure are certainly hugely important, not, just in, uh, not least in terms of social justice and equity. But we must still ask what people are doing culturally, rather than simply asking from where they're missing. And this means valorizing other than publicly funded culture, something I know Canadian arts organizations are working hard at, reorganizing hierarchies of art form and art practice to engage a wider public. These 
imperatives take on a very distinctive character, as I've learned, in the context of indigenous, indigenous art, artists and audiences. And I've learned a great deal about the challenges and the commitment in our discussions yesterday and today. And so to the third of my four questions, which asks whether we're looking in the right places when we look for value. The report has six separate chapters on what we call components of cultural value. Whoops, that's not needed. On what we call components of cultural value. The first two, on the reflective individual and the engaged citizen, are emphasised because they're often neglected as we, as we reach for more immediate and quantifiable outcomes. The other four components may be more expected, the economy, cities, health and education. But in each, our analysis highlights personal experience of arts and culture. Personal experience, as an individual or in social settings, is harder to capture in quantitative indicators, but it's often a key to understanding. Let me start with the reflective individual, in which a, 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 long, a long chapter explores how arts and, arts and culture help shape reflective individuals with greater understanding of themselves and their lives, more empathy towards others, and an appreciation of the diversity of human experience and people. And I was struck by the way in which Jill talked about how Arts Club were trying to begin to find out about some of those issues. We draw on an eclectic body of research in the report. It includes art in prisons, which may not itself reduce reoffending, but begins the process that criminologists call desistance, the journey by which offenders come to see themselves as people with choices, able to imagine futures in which they are not offenders. Other examples include art supporting professional staff in care homes, the ability of good quality literature to improve scores on, psychology, on psychological theory of mind tests, and how the theme of disability in museums displays in museum displays made visitors question their own assumptions about disability. Or how group reading of literature out loud helps vulnerable and damaged people with little experience of reading make sense of their lives. These case studies are not there because they justify arts and cultural experience themselves, but rather because they signal a major result of cultural engagement for all of us in making us think about ourselves and our lives. And there's also evidence of the way it develops citizenship, not just activity in civil society organisations and volunteering, which is what US studies have concentrated on, but also, and more interestingly, I think, helping articulate a broader, often critical, political imagination. We see this in diverse ways, getting people to think about climate change, using public art in civic action, or the complex outcomes of using culture in peace building after armed conflict. Art can translate abstract ideas into narratives on a human scale and fuel a political imagination that is essential to democratic societies. And in such ways, whether reflectiveness as, in, as, as individuals or engagement as citizens, cultural participation can create spaces for uncertainty and questioning and force us to reimagine re our own assumptions. This, rather than when being didactic, is when art is at its most powerful. Now, I've dwelt on these two dimensions of how we often look in the wrong places for the value of arts and culture, not only because engagement is a key theme of this summit, but also because they're neglected in public discussion. I can't take you through, I can't take you through um, our other components, but for each, economy, towns, health and education, we confirm how much arts and culture contributes, but we question some of the claims made. We must reshape our narrative about value in each of these. Its value for the economy, for example, lies not in economic impact, where the methodologies really raise serious problems. Instead, we should think about how a vibrant cultural infrastructure supports the creative industries, or how it's part of a wider innovation system, shaping a population that's challenging and creative in the wider economy, or how a lively cultural environment attracts talent and investment to a city. And similarly, Similarly, for the question of towns and cities, the dominant narrative sees large cultural infrastructural projects and creative districts as key paths to urban regeneration. Well, these may regenerate places, but they usually do so by driving out the resident communities as, as gentrification makes the districts unaffordable for those who once lived there, including the very creatives who often made the place attractive in the first place. Instead, Look at the evidence that smaller scale cultural assets have a positive effect on neighbourhoods. For example, the impressive recent work on New York 
by the social impact of the arts project at the University of Philadelphia, finding that in poorer neighborhoods, poorer neighborhoods, small commercial community and participatory arts are associated with more sustainable social benefits and may actually constitute a much more balanced and organic path to regeneration. So what I'm saying is, and we say this over six chapters, let's look in the right places when we take charge of the narrative about the value, relevance, and impact of arts and culture. And when we do so, it's important to get our methods and evidence fit for purpose, which is my fourth and final question. By what methods should we find and evidence the value of arts and culture? Quantitative methods are essential where they provide appropriate evidence, but they are not in themselves better or more rigorous than other forms of evidence. The search for measurable indicators of value starts with what can be counted, rather than asking what we're interested in and how best to evidence it. Here is the attraction of simple quantitative indicators. Art in prisons is evaluated by reoffending rates, or effects on the economy through economic impact case studies, when the real benefit in each area is known to be much more complex and much more rewarding. If we want to understand the value of culture, we must question the hierarchy of evidence that privileges quantitative data, the experimental method, and randomized control trials. Linear cause and effect, such as, lin as randomized control trials demonstrate, can only be established in very precise situations to answer very precise questions. Most research on arts and culture, and actually most research on m m most other things in society, is not susceptible to that kind of evidence and methodology. Yet the experimental method and randomized control trial are seen as the gold standard in areas for which they, have not, they were not devised. We must recognize the equal validity and rigor of methods drawn from the arts and humanities and qualitative social science if we're to make progress in research and evaluation. Not least because they offer the means to evidence the complexity of cultural experience and the difference that that cultural experience makes to people. So these include methods from ethnography, history, linguistics, the arts, and other disciplines. They involve close reading of texts, images, language, and performance, analysis of meanings and representations, exploration of historical parallels. Methodolog methodological rigor is present in these disciplines as much as it is in the sciences, but it's better suited to the complexity of the experiences that characterize arts and culture. Most of the original research funded by the Cultural Value Projects used such methods. For example, reading groups for vulnerable people organized by the reader organization that I've referred to were researched through meticulous linguistic and literary analysis of word-for-word -word transcripts. Ethnographic methods were used to examine, were used to examine an improvisatory dance group for older people in Gateshead, which led people to reflect about themselves and their identity. And it was only through ethnographic research they could capture what was going on in that group. Focus groups were used to learn how people value two works of public art in the English coastal town of Ilfracombe in Devon. Damien Hurst's Verity is a 66-foot high bronze of a naked, woman, a naked pregnant woman towering over the waterfront. At about the same time, Alex Hartley's Nowhere Island appeared, a piece of land revealed by a retreating glacier in the Norwegian high Arctic, which Alex Hartley mounted on a raft. It was pulled into international waters, proclaimed a new nation, and towed around the southwest coast of England. Its visit to a town was preceded by a program organized by its land-based embassy, where where people signed up as citizens and debated its evolving new constitution. The focus groups used images in what's called a visual matrix, providing a non-verbal stimulus to generate different types of discussion. Now, those are just some examples. The depth provided by case studies, typical of the arts and humanities as disciplines, thus sits alongside the breadth provided by large-scale data capture. Each brings something different to our understanding. And in calling for the valorization of arts and humanities methods, I'm not in any way decrying those of science or quantitative social science. What matters is that methods be appropriate 
for the understanding that is being sought. Asking people who engage with arts and culture what they value about it can be fruitful, whether the audience studies we've discussed at the summit or econometric approaches such as contingent valuation, which infers value from studies of people's declared hypothetical willingness to pay and on which we funded some important work through the Cultural Value Project. A much larger landscape of conceptual and methodological approaches are needed if we're to take charge of the narrative and if we're to believe in it. And by the way, my call to use much more systematic, qualitative evidence doesn't mean capturing more of the anecdotes we so love to tell in the cultural sector. As someone once said, the plural of anecdote is not data. And a final challenge arises in my fourth question, how to understand the difference that arts and culture makes by bringing together these different forms of evidence. There's the evidence gathered to tell funders what they want to hear. There's the evidence gathered to help cultural organisations develop their audiences. And there's the evidence gathered by artists and programmers to find out whether their artistic and their social objectives have been met and more. It's a challenge to bring them all together, not least because the will, the time and the resources needed are hard to muster in, in, in busy artistic and institutional lives. Another problem, though, is that by long acquiescing in the belief that value is found only by counting, we've lost so much of the granularity and depth of understanding that we need. Indeed, if we're looking for the value of specific cultural organisations or programmes, we need multi-criteria analysis that draws on a variety of approaches, capturing and reporting different kinds of value. The balanced scorecard, devised for business to monitor performance on a variety of strategic goals, brings together different criteria without losing their separate meanings, presenting quantitative and qualitative results in a report that balances the various outcomes. Social return on investment, SROI, is a multi-criteria approach that's increasingly used by cultural and third sector organisations. And it's attractive in that it involves stakeholders and it involves capturing non-financial outcomes. But this multi-criteria approach requires a single financial result, X dollars of return on every dollar invested, which means you have to find financial proxy values for non-financial benefits, such as confidence or community cohesion. And thus you lose the benefit of reporting on a variety of criteria. I don't know how much it's used by the cultural sector in Canada, though it was mentioned yesterday, and I have grave doubts about SROI. So, my four questions that need addressing. If we're to talk about the value of arts and culture, the task now is to enlarge our vision, to insist on the complexity of what we need to know, and to draw on the range of methods and evidence that can deliver that. Then we'll be in a much better position to take control of the narrative, and to show government and funders that we can offer more interesting dimensions of value and a fuller range of ways of knowing than they have ever dreamed of. I can't speak for Canada, but in the UK, we'd then be much better equipped to capture the diversity of cultural engagement, practices and experiences, as well as their re relevance and their impact. Thank you. <laughs>